Hello and welcome to episode 433 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. I'm Nathan Fox. With me is Ben Olson. We're the co-founders of LSATdemon.com and the LSAT Demon Daily podcast. You can be LSAT famous by sharing news or asking questions on our website, thinkinglsat.com. We've got uh, a test registration deadline coming up in just a couple of weeks. The LSAT, uh, the the February 2024 registration deadline is the day after Christmas, uh, December 26th. Boxing Day is the day that you have to decide whether you want to register for the February test. It's a simple calculus. Are Do you feel like your practice tests reflect the kind of score that is going to get you where you want to go at the price you want to pay, um, then you should register. And if not, then probably don't. Pretty, pretty simple. There's no need to register way in advance. There's no need to decide what else that you're going to take months and months in advance. You don't really know when you're going to be ready. So you should just watch your practice test scores. And when they start getting into the range, you'll know that they're getting into the range and then you can register. So between now and December 26th, you can think about whether you want to register for that February test. Uh, you want to say a bit about the games, Ben, for the February tw- for the February test? Yeah, it's what you have February, April, and June. It's that's it. Your your last three attempts, including yep. February. Yep. Not counting January because the registration deadline for that has already passed. But uh, if you're not taking the January test, then there are only three tests remaining where you do have a chance to take the logic games. For some people, they're like, fuck that. I don't want to take the logic games. But, mm-hmm. you know, and it's great. I'll see you um, maybe in April or May. We can start preparing to to shoot for that uh, August test. That if, you're, if you're sure you're not going to take games, okay, fine. But for those of you who can see it as an opportunity, it is a big opportunity because it's the section that people are going to score perfectly on. If they're going to score perfectly on any section, it's probably the games with the right preparation. You could score perfectly on the games, huge opportunity. And there's only three more chances to register for that February, April, and June of 2024. All right. Hey, you've got, uh, another vocabulary corner right at the top of the show. Yeah, so this is the sentence I read. It's considered a zoonotic parasite, which means it can be transmitted from animals to humans. Um, The sentence conveniently defines the word, but I had never seen zoonotic. Have you? I think I might have. I might have maybe seen the word before, but I. Yeah, I would have no idea what that meant, except for the. The context here, the sentence just actually gives you a definition. I would point out that that happens all the damn time on LSAT reading comprehension Mm -hmm. all the time. Like, what do you think, Ben? Like 50 percent of the passages, maybe? Yeah, they would probably drop this phrase, which means it can be right. It would just say an organism that that is or that can be transmitted from animals to humans. It's a little more subtle, but it's still just a straight up definition. Right in the sentence. Yeah. They, I mean, a lot of times they do it with M dashes. Mm-hmm. M dashes or commas. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, it, and they probably would have, you know, how they do it on LSAT reading comprehension, which is like, let's take three sentences and cram it all into one sentence. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so it, I can totally imagine the first sentence of like a sciencey seeming, you know, scary passage. Yeah. And it's going to say something like, and such and such researcher in not two in 1822 discovered the first zoonotic parasite M dash, a parasite that can be transmitted from animals to humans M dash. And then, and it would just go on and on with some longer bullshit, right? Yeah. I, I see that you changed the pronunciation. Google says it should be pronounced Zoa. I think that's going to be zoo. oh and i i was saying zoonotic yeah yeah zoonotic i'm sure it's probably zoonotic it uh, the word obviously looks like zoonotic but yeah, sure. yeah um pronunciation is there in google does google's definition match the definition that you found when you were reading it does yeah can yep. be transmitted from animals to humans do we have an example of a zoonotic parasite covid maybe or is that Maybe that wasn't coming from animals. <laughs> I guess we don't know. Oh, yeah. That's what we thought at one point, right? That it came yeah. from bats or something like that. Maybe. Yeah. But there's that other one, bird flu, right? Isn't that 
like by definition coming from birds. Or it was intentionally foisted on us by the Chinese government. We'll never know. <laughs> Sorry for laughing. Uh, millions of people dying. But um, OK, there's your vocabulary corner for today. We've got uh, three emails about appeals. You want to take the first one? Yeah. It says, hi, Nathan. A few months ago, you brought up that some schools allow you to request to have old grades changed. Well, I had a whole semester of Fs because I bit off entirely more than I could chew at 16, two jobs, an internship, and community college, and I just stopped going to classes instead of dropping them. Very, very common story, right? Like, there's so many people who fucked up their undergrad for all kinds of different reasons. Yeah, and this person started undergrad at 16? Yeah. Community wait, yeah. college? Wow, yeah. yeah. Well, I'd, like work, you know, genuinely working to try to better Like, I'm sure that Ariana thought that she was doing the exact thing that she should be doing with her life. I mean, I would be proud of a 16 year old who was working two jobs and an internship and going to community college already. It's like, great, you're doing a great job of getting started with your life. And then you smash cut to the end of the semester where they have decided that community college was too much, stopped going to the classes didn't drop them and got a whole semester of straight F's. Yeah. Just not aware of the system and how well, it works. And yeah. even right. And, and even, you know, well-meaning first gen parents are going to be like, Oh, that's okay. You can just try again. That's, you know, no problem. Like what that's yeah. A, just that, retake those classes or yeah, just start again. You don't get those semester. credits, but you'll start over again next semester and it doesn't matter. Turns out it does matter. It, and it can matter 20 years later when you apply to law school, it can matter a lot. Anyway, Ariana continues. I decided to see if the college had some type of grade forgiveness program, and they did. It took me a while to get them to even allow me to apply because they had a one-year policy and the grades are 10 years old, but I was very persistent and they actually changed the policy for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I still wasn't sure if I had an actual case or not, so I found as much evidence from that time as I could and compiled it with my future goals and how these grades were impeding them. It took over a month for them to get back to me, but I just got the email and they approved my request to change the grades from Fs to Ws. I already had a solid LSAT 176, but this will take my GPA from a 3.7 high to a 4.0 mid. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for everything. All the best, Ariana. Wow, that's a big difference. And now <laughs> you can really compete at the best schools in the country. Yeah, and if you think about, I mean, we were yelling about this a year ago, at least, I'm sure. We were yelling about why do schools fuck over their own students with these egregious policies about replacing old grades, fixing old grades, you know, like for, for someone like Ariana, who this is five years at least later, maybe a decade later. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. It is a decade later. Ten years, she says. So a decade later, she's like, look, I've I'm sure she went back to school. Did I mean, she did great. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then what benefit does this community college get from fucking her over on her law school applications ten years later? None. And it's amazing that she went and advocated at the school and uh, got them to change the whole pot. I wish I knew what school that was. That's amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. I hope LSAC will honor this, right? She's If she hasn't already submitted her transcripts, then she just wants to make sure that that change is done before she gets the transcripts submitted to LSAC. If she has already submitted the old transcripts with the Fs, She's going to need to talk to LSAC about how to get that replaced. Yeah. And that might require phone calls, emails. You know, luckily, Ariana is very all caps persistent. And that just feels like a lawyer to me. You're, you're going to get what you want if you keep asking. Terrific. Yeah. Next awesome. one comes from Anonymous. Hi, LSAT Demon Team. I recently applied for an LSAC fee waiver and was denied. I'm a paralegal in NYC. And I make more than the 300% income limit for the tier two waiver as an independent applicant, but I don't make enough to cover all LSAT and law school expenses on my own. And who does? I mean, that's a, that's a lot of expenses. 
So I decided to appeal LSAC's decision. I treated my situation like I would treat a case at work. I explained in detail my financial situation and expenses as a first-generation college student and law school applicant and submitted vast evidence to support my claims. I was able to use my experience to appeal the denial of my fee waiver successfully. I was approved a week after submitting my appeal. Thank you to Ben and Nathan for the advice on fee waivers. It helped me greatly during the process. That's example number two, Ben, of one of our listeners going out there, working their ass off in order to advocate for themselves. And lawyers work their asses off to advocate for their clients. So this is, this is just fantastic. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Like I'm imagining anonymous sending a file box or, you know, you know how you see that in like uh, TV shows, better call Saul, you know, it's like all of a sudden the paralegals are rolling in with the hand trucks, and, you know, and just yeah. like stacks and stacks of file boxes. <laughs> and I can just imagine anonymous dropping file boxes worth of supporting documentation about her expenses. <laughs> and then LSAC in a week, they've already approved it. They just see the file box and they're like, stamp uh, approved on the outside here you go. Of it. <laughs> yeah good yeah. you're gonna obviously fight this battle longer than we want to so right exactly <laughs> and that's I mean, it's very very much how like actual legal practice works mm -hmm. right i mean there's times where you're just like we can't do this because we're gonna get into this crazy paperwork war of our army of associates doing doc review versus their army of associates doing doc review and we're going to lose because they have, you know, they want to win more than we want to win. Yeah. Next one's from Nafasat. Yeah. So she wants to appeal LSAC for an additional test date as an international applicant. There's no February test for the Ooh. international test takers. And here's what she writes. I attempted to appeal to appeal their policy and received a message that the limited test dates are for security reasons. Well, of course, that's what they're going to say. I mean, they just yeah. don't want to do it. It's it's time. It's money. It's like it's effort. And they want to do things the way they've always done it. So, of course, they're going to come back and say it's for security reasons. She continues, I would like to take the test in February, ideally, since Logic Games will be will not be administered from August on, and they are my best section. I am registered to take the test in January, April, and June, my first three attempts, but would like to use all five if needed. Any advice? I think you're fucked on that. I don't I don't think you're gonna get them to add an inter I mean, eventually, if enough international <coughs> applicants complain about this, then yeah. But you getting it done in time for them to administer a February test internationally, that ain't going to happen, I don't think. What do you think? I'd be shocked. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess I don't understand the security concerns. And I'm surprised that people don't use VPNs or something like that to circumvent this limitation. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying... Like you could fly, you could literally fly to the U.S. to take the test in February, or you could use a VPN. <laughs> I think I don't know how that works, but I I do think that that is an option though. Your fly to the U.S. I mean, I know that that is Nafasat's coming from halfway around the world, and so I just don't know that she would be able to to do it. Um, yeah, but if you can fly to the U.S., it might be worth it. I don't know. Um, yeah. maybe you've got some other reason you can, you know, put it adjacent to some other thing that you wanted to do in the U S you are applying presumably to law school in the U S or Canada. So it seems like maybe you could figure out a way to get to North America. Um, otherwise, yeah, good luck. I just, I think that you've got, it's just so, it's so much harder for them to say yes to this request. Cause they have so, to add an international test. That's just. Yeah, I, I think it would I think you would need some sort of like groundswell and it, it's just going to be really hard to rally people to the cause of international applicants. Yeah, right. I mean, because like domestic applicants don't want things to be better for international applicants. Yeah, that's your competition. So you're not going to rally any domestic. I mean, you some allies you might get to say like me. I mean, I'll say that's clearly unfair to the international applicants. What are you doing? But my hypothesis would be that it's more like inertia. They've always done four international tests. They would love not to have to expand that capacity. 
they international applicants make up a pretty small chunk of applicants. Why would they want to serve this market better? I mean, truth is that they're going to look at their number of applicants and they're like, yeah, we don't think it would be profitable to offer this test. Yep. Sorry, not for that. So the LSAT logic games are going away starting, not now, starting in August of 2024, but we are well prepared for the future. Ben, you want to talk a little bit about what our amazing team did to create the LSAT toggle, like within days of the LSAT announcement? Yeah. So if you have an LSAT daemon account, you can go in, click on your profile, click on the advanced setting tab, and then just turn off logic games. And, and the um, advantage there is it, it, it changes a lot of things that you can't actually see, <laughs> but it helps you if you're planning to not take the test with games. Because what happens is if you go drill, instead of giving you drill questions with all three sections, of course, it will exclude games. Same if you go try to do time sections and you just want the demon to choose which sections to give you, it will exclude games. But also, if you do a practice test, it will, of course, give you a test without logic games, but it will also calculate your likely score based on a slightly different scale, a scale that's now considering the two logical reasoning sections and the reading comp section rather than the game section, which is going to add a couple more questions to each of those scales. But anyways, we've basically gone through the 99 scales or 195 scales or whatever that are available and we've tweaked them to adjust for this change. So anyways, the bottom line is if you turn on or basically you actually, the toggle is yes or no. If you say no to logic games, <laughs> then all these things will happen on the back end, and you can now use the daemon the same way you use it today but just uh, prepare for the test without games. Yeah, as we get closer to the actual transition in 2024, I would anticipate that we would probably surface that toggle even higher. And at some point we might be asking, are you interested in the get like at the at the top, like on the front, right? When you first log into the demon, it might be something like games versus no games, because yeah. eventually we're going to just change it to the default is no games. Obviously, as soon as the June administration occurs, we're going to flip that switch so that the games are just gone. Like you can't They're gone. for an LSAT. Yeah, right yeah. now you can you can turn them off, but you, you'll you see them disabled just as a kind of a confirmation that they're still there. But if you want to turn them back on, but they're disabled. Yeah. But yeah. So again, for now, for people who are preparing for January, February, April, or June, use the demon as normal and you'll see all three scored sections of the test. If you are preparing for August, you can also use the demon now uh, but go into your advanced settings and turn off the games. If you know you're not going to ever prepare for, if you're not going to ever take the official LSAT with logic games, then I, it's fun to prepare for the games. And there are things you can learn from studying the games and it might help you prepare for like future evolution of logical reasoning questions that are going to be kind of more like these little mini logic games. We've seen a little bit of that in recent tests, but yeah, you probably want to just flip that toggle to, <clears throat> to off if you know that you're not going to take the LSAT before August of 2024. Focus on reading comp and especially logical reasoning. Yep. Next one is from <clears throat> Anonymous. Eric, uh, producer Eric, put this on the agenda. A law professor at Notre Dame wrote this blog post about the median debt to income ratio of students at ABA law schools. Ben, I thought we could look at it together. The worst debt to income ratios are often the lowest ranked schools. No surprise there. So Western Michigan is on this list with an almost five times debt to income ratio. So in other words, if you owe, uh, let's say you're making 50 grand, that means you owe 250 grand. That's probably pretty close to what it, what it is at Western Michigan but we can click into that blog, blog post and take a, a more detailed look because the list is there. At the top, a Harvard grad's median debt is about 50,000 lower than Yale and 60,000 lower than Stanford. Columbia median grads are over 100,000 more in debt than Harvard, which, you know, Columbia definitely not mentioned in the same breath as Harvard Law School, right? We usually think of Harvard, Stanford, Yale, Lately, maybe Chicago because it popped up there into the top of the U.S. news rankings last year. 
but we don't usually say Columbia in the same breath as these schools, but still you're going to owe a hundred thousand dollars more for your Columbia degree than you are for your Harvard degree. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Hmm. He, that is this law professor at Notre Dame makes this point. Quote, of course, medians are likely skewed in other ways. The highest earning graduates likely received the largest scholarships. Wow. And, of course, sorry, and accordingly, graduated with the lowest debt. I'm interested in hearing your response, says Anonymous, to the debt to income chart. Well, I had to scroll all the way to the bottom. Pontifical Catholic University of Puerto Rico. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Puerto has Rico, a yeah. has a debt to income ratio, median debt to income ratio of eight point four three. So, median debt of one hundred twenty two thousand, one hundred twenty three thousand dollars, and median income of fifteen grand. Yeah, it's Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a very poor place. But they're charging those same prices for law school. That's just. That's insane. I mean, I hope those numbers are wrong. I mean, that's an extreme example, but I was just curious what was at the bottom. Still, there are all these other schools that have these ratios of, you know, two times, three times. Yeah. I went straight to my alma mater. Okay. You formerly known as University of California Hastings College of the Law. They have a not great debt to income ratio of 1.64. Uh, and what that means is you're owing on average $139,000 when you graduate from that school. I owed $140,000. Hmm. So right on the money there. And $84,000 income. Yeah. <laughs> it. Uh, how long does it take you to pay off $139,000 plus interest when you're only making $84,000 a year? Oof. Oh, and presumably you're trying to live in San Francisco. Yeah, that's not going to happen quickly because that 139 is also growing every year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the truth is that the vast majority of Hastings grads don't live in San Francisco after they graduate. You think you're going to, but then the <laughs> there's a big difference between talking to the admissions office and talking to the employment office, right? You talk to the admissions office up until the moment you accept And then at that moment, the admissions office is like, well, yeah, we don't have anything else to do with you. So now you talk to the employment office. If you have to go to, you have to start hunting them down. They're not going to chase you. You have to chase them. And if you start talking to the employment office about jobs, they're going to very quickly start talking to you about, oh, well, you know, you, you really should expand. You should start. We there's, we've had a lot of really great job placement in Fresno and Bakersfield and Modesto. And, you know, all these places that are like in the same state as Hastings, but they're not on the same planet as Hastings in terms of where you're going to have to actually live and work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess I'm, this is a little bit wild to me because, for example, George Mason University is number three on this list. So, yeah, your, your income is substantially lower than Harvard's 80 grand or median income. But median debt is 65, which isn't surprising. That's a state school. Um, maybe maybe their tuition rate is lower or something, yeah. or they're giving scholarships. I don't know. But like coming out with that sort of ratio where your your debt is lower than your income makes it so much easier to pay off. And Yale, you see Yale? Yale is way down here. Harvard's at the top, but Yale, where did I see that? Yale has median debt of 140 or 141. Yale's Yale, man. They can charge whatever they want. They're the number one. They're the tip of the pyramid and everybody knows it. Why is there, why is there median income though? Only 85. Uh, because maybe a lot of people who are really in that high of the ivory tower don't necessarily go take high paying prestigious. Like I think that, you know, if you're going to, how is that different uh, than Harvard though? Harvard is astronomically different in terms of median income. Yeah, that's true. I don't know. Um, I hope these numbers are right. Well, there, so there is a long caveat in the middle of the, um, 
There's a couple, I think everybody should read this blog post. I think this is really useful information. So this is, by the way, Derek T. Muller, professor of law at Notre Dame Law School. Hmm. And I, I would encourage you to, to read this whole thing. Believe it or not, Ben, the numbers might be worse than what they appear because the median federal loan debt accumulated at the school by student borrowers of federal loans who completed an award at the indicated field of study, non-federal loans, Perkins loans, and federal loans not made to students like the Federal PLUS loan program are not included in the calculation. What? Also that makes not these included, numbers almost useless. Also not included in, well, it, it, it does make them useless for comparative purposes. Yeah, because you don't know what schools have tendencies to use those other loans. Correct. But, it still serves a purpose in it, it, as just a broad cautionary tale. Yeah. Right. That, that these numbers are at least that bad. Oh, by the way, it also doesn't count undergraduate <laughs> debt. Yeah. So if you're carrying a undergrad debt, but Pay through still. JD Ben with, you know, 150 from undergrad plus another 150 from law school. I'm willing to treat that as a separate, a separate stupid decision. I would, I would say, when you're deciding whether to go to law school, knowing how much debt you're going to incur for that, and then the income that will, well, actually, you'd still have to subtract the income you could have made with your undergrad degree, right, to really see, to compare these two numbers. Because this is, this is your total income, which presumably somewhat depends on your undergrad, yeah. but the debt, you're right, doesn't include your undergrad. We've, okay. we've already yeah. said the real doozy of it, too, which, and I want to say this again. Medians are likely skewed, that is median incomes and debt, are likely skewed in other ways. The highest earning graduates likely received the largest scholarships and accordingly graduated with the lowest debt. Yeah, so looking at the median is not that helpful, right? <laughs> Just like looking at the median salary for lawyers is not helpful. So it's yeah. not helpful here to be looking at the median. I mean... Hey, we got to do the best we can, right? What do we want the guy to do if not look at the medians? We, sure. You got to look at you, something. You right? got to look at something. Yeah. But I just want, all I'm saying is great work. Uh, excellent work, Derek Muller, Professor Muller. And if you would like to come on the show, we would love to talk to you more about this because I'm sure you could explain a lot of stuff to us. So please come on thinking else at. But it's worse than this because <laughs> if you barely squeaked into the school, your debt's going to be higher than this. Your debt's going to be higher and your income's going to be lower because yes. you're, you're above the median yes. on the debt and you're below the median on the income. And yes. so putting the two medians together, <laughs> yeah, you really need to pair, just pair everybody up in the class. What did the top of the class have in terms of income and what did the top of the class have in terms of debt? Oh, that I would love to see. Oh man. Show me the, yeah. Professor Muller, please have a research assistant. <laughs> Go look up the 25th percentile debt and 25th percentile income. That's yeah. what I really want And the want 75th see. percentile. So you can see the differences. Because it's probably the same person. Whoever has the, well, no, whoever has the 25th percentile debt is probably the person who has the 75th percentile income is what you're saying. Yeah. 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 We've said this for a long time, Ben, you know, that and we've seen it in practice that if you go to law school on a scholarship, you're likely to do better at that school. When you do better at that school, you're going to get better job opportunities. Pretty simple. Yeah. And so that would lead us to believe that if you go to school on a scholarship and you do better at school there and you make more money, then, yeah, you're going to graduate with less debt, more income. <laughs> and the flip side of that is all the people who barely squeaked into the school if it's true that people who get scholarships are likely to do better, then it's also true. This is an LSAT lesson, by the way. Mm -hmm. If it's true that people who get scholarships tend to do better, then it has to be true that people who don't get scholarships tend to do worse mm -hmm. in terms of income. Yep. Well, that first statement means the same thing as the second statement. Yep. That's an LSAT. You'll see that in LSAT logical reasoning all the time. Mm. If X rises as Y rises, then X also falls as Y falls. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So 
<laughs> so, and that's the part that's like the scary part that Professor Mueller isn't saying here. But it's yeah, I, I would think that the people who have the highest debt higher than these debt numbers probably also have lower than these income numbers. Making it just even, you know, scarier, just shocking how bad of a deal this is at most law schools. If you're yeah. borrowing to go there, it's just a horrible deal. Okay. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that was really helpful. We got a meaty episode today. Uh, this next one comes from Anonymous, and it's about this video uh, that Dean Z just released. Do you want to read it? Sure. Uh, the subject is yield protection. Could you guys talk about the video Dean Z made about yield protection? I thought it was strange. She outright admitted her school practices this. I personally had two problems with this video. One, this is again from Anonymous. One, it makes it harder to go to a top law school for free because T14 will waitlist you if they think you won't accept. Two, the kid who gets denied from the T6 and yield protected from the rest of the T14 gets fucked. I don't know if it's going to be that simple. But anyway, summary, Dean Z doesn't like the term yield protection, but she confirms that it's a thing and that it's perfectly reasonable. Question, why admit someone that you're sure will go elsewhere? Yeah, that's from Eric. And it's it's an explanation of the logic, which yeah. I, I found the logic in Dean Z's video. It's only like a 13 minute video. You can watch it on double speed and get the gist of it. Um, Eric is agreeing with most of her points. And I think I agree with those points as well. You know, like people are pissed. <laughs> like, I guess people are like mad about the yield protection. You know, this anonymous correspondent is mad about the yield protection. But mm -hmm. look at it from Dean Z's perspective. If she's she says she can tell you're not going to go to her school. She's, she's like, I know that you're going to get admitted by Yale. And if you get admitted by Yale, she knows from experience that people who get admitted to both Michigan and Yale don't choose Michigan. Now, we would say, hey, maybe you want to consider that scholarship that Dean Z is likely to offer you at Michigan. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also possible that Dean Z is going to look at that and go, nope, you're. <clears throat> we, we can't. I, I'm not going to get you. And the way she says it, she says, I would have to work really hard to get you. Probably that means scholarship money. Yeah. <laughs> but. I can see there's times where she's not going to roll out the red carpet if she thinks that there's only a sliver of a chance that you're going to accept. Well, they want to use that money as judiciously as possible, right? So, right. yeah. Right. Next, what's the next point, bullet point? Every applicant that a school admits creates more work for the school. That I, makes sense. Well, I read it as actually... Oh, that's interesting. Every applicant that a school admits creates more work for the school. I thought she was saying every applicant that applies creates more work for the school. No. Yeah. She was saying if they just, if they choose to admit somebody, they're also deciding to now court this person. And so that's going to take some work. All she's doing then is admitting that she's like really interested in her yield. Well, I think the idea is that the motivation is, different. The motivation is we're trying to work better on the ones that we admit as opposed to but working why does she worse. care about that other than for yield? Because otherwise she would just admit all of the people that she would otherwise have yield protected and just see who comes. See who comes. Yeah. I, um, they I do mean, a lot of like, and you could see her doing it in the video. Yeah, they do a lot of very highfalutin like they see themselves as like a crafting each incoming class. You yeah. Know? Putting their hands on it. I'm going to put my it's just you just feel like a Michigan person to me. Like that there's that type of hocus pocus that's involved in the decision. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> but I mean, if you've already admitted somebody, then that means you definitely want them. You've already done all the work of deciding whether you want them or not. Then you admit them. And now, I mean, I think what she might be saying, or I think half of what she's saying is I'm going to have to make them a compelling scholarship offer to get them to come here. 
Yeah. Or right. Like there, there are ways to get people to come without giving them as much money as you might, if you didn't spend time courting them. I can give an example. Give an example. Go ahead. Yeah. You write an, uh, you write a letter to the person that you admit and you personally sign it. You personally sign it. You have with, your assistant add fake. one sentence that's like coming from their personal statement. <laughs> and they yeah. sign it for you or it's a digital replica of your signature. But it looks real enough that you think that Dean Z emailed you. Yeah. And you, you feel or, or sent you the letter. Yeah. Like you get that bullshit from every school, by the way. I mean, like yeah. this, I think not every school, but many, many schools. I've seen that at schools at various levels where they really are, you know, once they admit you, then they're going to really try to sell you on the idea that you've got to come to my school now. No, I agree. And I think, <laughs> I think they've done some sort of cost benefit analysis in their head. They're like, Hey, a certain amount of work or effort is going to take place by our team. And that's going to save us a certain amount of dollars in terms of scholarships, because we can get some of these people through those non-financial tactics, but they take time and effort. And so it's just easier to decide beforehand, Okay, I'm not going to deal with these people. I mean, I guess you could just admit them and then also choose not to do anything about it. But that may. Yeah, I don't know. Well, if you admit somebody and you don't offer them a scholarship, which they do, right? Like what? I mean, we can take a look at that. Um, I'm just going to look real quick at Dean Z's 509. LSATdemon.com forward slash scholarships. There's a link right there next to Michigan. 509 report. Um, yeah, remember we're talking about a school with a 171 and 3.83 median Mm -hmm. scholarship matrix down at the bottom of the third page says of 959 total students at Michigan law school in 2021 to 2022, 85% of them got a grant and 35% of them got half or more of a grant Hmm. more than a third of the class is paying less than half price to go to Michigan. So think about what Dean Z's off, you know, offers of admission, like, uh, and, and there are another 50 damn percent of the class that are getting a less than half tuition offer. So there's only 15% that are getting no offer whatsoever. I think it takes work and effort to figure out what numbers to come up with for exactly. these people. Yeah. I think when she's talking about work, what she means is we have to now negotiate with that person on the price. Yeah. And, and a lot of those people aren't going to negotiate at all because they they don't understand the game and they just, they jump up and, and down as soon as they get sort of any scholarship, but they still had to come up with a number that they think will work for that student. That's high enough to not <laughs> as, Higher yeah. than it needs to be, right? Yeah. It's got to be is a negotiation. as low as it can be possibly and still work. Yeah. I think people, when they think about a negotiation, they think about like, well, you're going to make an offer and then I'm going to make an offer and then you're going to make an offer and then I'm going to make an offer and then we're going to like meet in the middle somewhere, you know? Yep. And yep. many schools are going to say, no, we don't negotiate scholarships. Yeah. But the, the mere act of admitting them, the mere act of deciding to give them a scholarship or not to give them a scholarship, depending on whatever that is, yes. when that offer is made, all of that is... A negotiation. Of course it is. An offer is a negotiation. Actually, I would say it goes even further, right? This video that she's presenting is part of the negotiation. Is part of the negotiation. It's part of setting the mindset so that people challenge or don't challenge whatever offers they end up ultimately giving to whoever. Your your application is part of the negotiation, right? It's all negotiating. And then, but by the time, so she looks at you and she looks at your numbers and she says, and, and she's got to be thinking about it, right? They're thinking yeah. about it. It's not just, oh, this is a perfect person for Michigan. It's this is a perfect person for Michigan at a price because so this person's going to cost class gets no a stipend. No, this whatsoever. person's going to cost a stipend and they're still not going to come here. So fuck it. Bye. Right. Right. There were 29. There are or sorry. In 2021, 2022, there were 29 students at Michigan who are listed as more than full tuition. That might mean that they have a full ride grant from Michigan and extra grants from elsewhere. It also could mean we know that Michigan in the past has given stipends 
Uh, I remember someone turning down Harvard to go to Michigan for a $10,000 a year annual stipend in addition to their scholarship. Full ride. And wow. so <laughs> it it is a negotiation whether or not they say they negotiate. It's definitely a negotiation. They're going to make an offer. You're going to decide whether you want to just take the offer or ask them for more. Or even declining the offer is part of the negotiation. Yeah. Why? That's that's signaling to them that, hey, this isn't high enough for me. It doesn't mean no, no. It just means not good enough yet. Yeah. And it doesn't always end there. We have examples of the law school calling people back like the next day to say, we know we told you that you couldn't increase your scholarship and we appreciate that you withdrew your offer of admission and that you're, you know, you de declined that offer and you're going to go somewhere else. But just we had yesterday, this, just yesterday, we got a new donor. funding came in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the old car salesman. I went and talked to my manager, you know, and you've just got to be willing to walk away. You know, what's funny about that call, too, is that that is a negotiation as well, because there's this strong desire when someone reaches out with an olive branch for you to reciprocate. Mm -hmm. So I bet some of these, you know, these callbacks, it's like, Hey, we don't have to offer that much more. They're going to feel <laughs> special. Yep. Or they see your willingness to play hardball and they go, that's a lawyer. We wanted them before. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they're willing to play hardball with us makes us want them even more. Yeah. I mean, bottom line, willing to say no gives you lots of power. In sure. Any sort having, of a, having a credible backup because they don't have to come back and they could just be like, OK, bye, yeah. you know, and they yeah. probably will be like, OK, bye. But yep. if you really are genuinely willing to walk away to go to some other school for a better offer, then you got to do that. You got to walk away. It's crazy not to. Yeah. Um, and Dean Z knows that you're willing to do that. That's why Dean Z is conscious of her yield protection. She tries to claim that, you know, other schools are more into the yield protection than than she is. But it was pretty clear from the video that she had thought about it a lot. Two more bullet points here. Yes, rankings consider yield, but not as much as they used to. OK, but it's still a factor. So that's another reason to get rid of people you think you're just never going to win because why risk? Right. Right. The percentages go up and down, right? U.S. News is constantly tweaking their rankings yeah. algorithm and the schools are going to game that the best they can. But yield is part of the rankings formula. So, yes, they're going to be they're going to be interested in that. And, you know, like so correspondent here who's like pissed off, you know, this is fucked up or whatever. Who can't? They don't care. Why would they care? They're yeah. <laughs> they're they're in it for them. And, you know, that if you don't think the law schools are in it for for them, you are just wildly mistaken. Yeah. Next one. Last thing. Uh, law school admission is a holistic process. They love saying this phrase. Of course, they it's do. just cover in my mind for. Yeah, of course, she said um, we didn't think that some people would be a fit here. Well, that's another way of saying, I think it's going to cost us a lot of money to get you to come. Yep. Producer Eric points out that, um, that, that Michigan has a reputation for liberal use of their wait list. He says their graphs on LSD law dot, sorry, sorry, LSD dot law always show a lot of yellow. And I, I am looking at Michigan's, um, scatter plot here of LSAT versus GPA and mm. then accepted is green, waitlisted is yellow, rejected is red. And yeah, Michigan, Michigan does have uh, a pretty big cloud of waitlisted applicants. Mm. Mm -hmm. Using the waitlist, by the way, is an excellent way for students or sorry, for schools to do yield protection. I think I would use a wait list liberally if I was in law school admissions because I would wait list all the people who I wasn't sure about 
And then I would wait to see how interested they are in coming to my school. And when they 100%. write me their letter of continuing interest, mm -hmm. then I would get a sense of where their head's at. Yep. Without... If they don't write me a letter of continuing interest, then I just happily deny them. Mm -hmm. Or actually, you never even get denied, do you? You, you just, just never say list. anything. Yeah. Yeah. It just expires. Yeah. It's just you're on the wait list and then school just starts and it's just like, hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 like a passive aggressive strategy, right? It's it's um you're not even willing to to own one side of the coin or the other. You're just like, wait, wait. Hey, by the way, that happened to 452 people at Michigan last year. Wow. Yeah. Does this graph turn into waitlisted and, and then eventually accepted? I don't see any of those. Must be. Oh, wait, no. There's a tiny question mark. Oh, number of waitlisted to accepted 10, <laughs> 10 out of, okay. 462 that. Yeah. 10 out of 462, Ben, that's your chances of getting in off of the waitlist at Michigan. <laughs> 10 out of a hundred would be 10%. We're talking about 2%, mm -hmm. two and a half two two point something percent chance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Almost not worth it. If if Michigan is, though, your dream school and you would go at any price. I, that's what I'd be fishing for. But wait, are any of these applicants who went from waitlisted to accepted ones who were. There for yield protection. They were well, yeah. overqualified. Yeah, yeah. And would they come back with a scholarship offer? No. <laughs> That's crazy because you're just well, tipping your hand, right? You're like, oh, I really want to go here. Right. That's what I'm talking about. That's how I would do it. Right. Yeah. So look, I'm smart, rational, uh, pragmatic thinker, right? Lo like logical let's, thinker. Let's, I like just, games. Let's not go too far. Let's just, uh, what, what's your. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just, it, you know. Reason can get you pretty far in the world. And so like thinking about what I would do rationally, yeah. knowing what mm -hmm. I know about the incentives that these people face. Yeah. If I, I would love to wait list a lot of people that I wasn't sure about mm -hmm. and then just see what they come back to me, just see how hard they come back to me. And if somebody with this 180 and 4.0 or whatever, I think on the video, she said more like 175 and 4.0 or 1.75 and 4.2 or something where it was like, wow, OK, so this person is clearly above Michigan's. Did you notice that she was like she's so frank about the fact that she loses most people to Yale? Like if 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 it's her versus Yale, people are going to Yale. Mm -hmm. I was kind of surprised by that. I mean, I get it that Yale is number one out of the number one, but Michigan is also a state that people super love. And if and Michigan Law School is a fabulous place, and especially if you're from there and have roots there and Ann Arbor is a super <laughs> Ann Arbor is awesome. And New Haven sucks, by mm -hmm. the way. And so <laughs> like, I'm sorry for shitting on New Haven, but I've only heard from people who went to Yale say New Haven sucks. Um. Yeah, it's hard for her to get those applicants. So then, yeah, why wouldn't she yield protect all those people? And oh, by the way, did you notice, Ben, hovering over those yellow dots? Yeah. It's pretty fucking good ones in there. Yeah. How about Oro Chimaru, who had an LSAT 180 and a GPA of 4.14 and got waitlisted, never admitted? How about Impossible Loose Goblin, who had LSAT 176, GPA 4.25, waitlisted, never accepted? There are many 180s on here, 180s and high GPAs that got waitlisted and never accepted. Yeah. Um, I wonder, like, so now I'm looking at the green dots. So short Bobcat, LSAT 180, GPA 3.96. I would love to know whether that applicant had gotten waitlisted and then been admitted, because that seems like the perfect one where... <clears throat> and. I, I never finished my, my like hypothetical, but I can just imagine if it were me getting these letters of continued, continued interest and short Bobcat or whoever it is says, Hey, my wife is in medical residency at Michigan medical school yeah, or hospital, whatever it is. And I just can't 
go anywhere. I really want to go to Michigan. I can't afford to go anywhere else. I won't go any, I can't be away from my wife. I can't be away from my kids. My mother is here and she's ailing and I have to take care of her. I would think that that's how you move from the waitlisted to the accepted. <laughs> 10 out of 452 people. I mean, so looking at this waitlisted chart, which has so many people on it and so many people with good scores. And given how much money Michigan is giving to its class that it ultimately admits. You have to think that. Yeah, that's why she's saying these applicants aren't going to come here. Yeah. It's just a straight up competition. They wouldn't pay a cent more than they had to. Go check out that video. Yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, it is telling. Ooh, check out their decision date versus LSAT. Hmm. That's pretty interesting. It just, the green dates, uh, the green dots are scattered way, way to the floor. left. <laughs> yeah. They come I mean, early in September of, I don't understand this graph even. So it's, a lot of decisions are being made before January. Self-reported data. So that one outlier there might just be fake. Yeah. It could, it could definitely be that the first wave of applications happen or the first wave of admittances happened somewhere probably in like November. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised at all. But then like over half of those applicants are, are before like February. Yeah. <laughs> then everybody's getting denied after that. I mean, like if you look at the reds. Well, you see a, you see a big group of yellow in the middle right around February and March. So yeah, they're, they're waitlisting you at that point. They're like, Hey, we have already accepted a ton of people. You might be better in terms of numbers of people we've already admitted, but we're running out of seats. Yeah, and we might be at the phase where we're really making sure that we have to get people in who are going to pay, right? Because yeah. I think that's how I would probably do it too, is that I would be aggressively offering admittance and scholarships for people who I was sure I wanted in my class. And I would start negotiating, you know, I would start trying to get them locked in early in the cycle because I'm always going to be able to get people who are willing to pay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I just have to dip down a little bit lower for, <laughs> you know, just later in the cycle, I just can admit some people who have, you know, potentially lower numbers because I didn't, you know, I wasn't out there fishing for them earlier in the cycle, but now it's like, well, okay, I, you know, I, I am going to admit 10 more people or I am going to admit 30 more people, but no scholarship offers for any of those people. Yeah. Cause I got to pay the bills. Cool. I would imagine that she has like revenue targets, <laughs> you know, like I think, I, I think it's very clear to them. It, it's a sales job, right? And you motivate salespeople by giving them sales and revenue targets. And oh, she's a salesperson. Is, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, this is all mapped out. As soon as they admit people for a certain amount of money, I'm sure they have a software program that tells them, okay, this is how much more you can put towards this person. Yep. And look at how this affects the overall projections. And they yep. got to keep that projection within a certain yep. band. 100%. My dad used to work for a, uh, used to work for Cisco, the food distribution company. Mm. S Y S C O. You see the trucks around everywhere. Mm. And he was in the beginning of his career. He was a, like a, he would go around to the restaurants. He had all these accounts at the restaurants that would order food regularly from Cisco. And he would go in there and talk to the, uh, talk, talk to the, you know, owner or whatever, and make up their order for the week help them make up their order for the week. And they had a computer program where the, all the prices on the computer program were flexible and it all calculated at the bottom of the spreadsheet, you know, like here's your total profit margin on this sale. Mm. And the salespeople were compensated based on that total profit margin number. Mm. And so if 
the pizza guy is like, hey, I can't pay that much for tomato sauce. I, you know, your competitor over here is only charging me, um, you know, six dollars a can for this tomato sauce. And you're trying to charge me seven dollars a can for the tomato sauce. And I, I can't do that. I'm not, you know, I'm, you, you got to you got to meet their price there. And you can just go in. He could go into the spreadsheet and he could put, oh, yeah, sure. Six dollars for tomato sauce. And then also bump up all these other prices <laughs> so that you end up getting the exact same profit margin in the end. Wow. Yeah. You know, you play around with that too much. Obviously, the client is going to say, fuck off. Uh, well, the customer. But look how much, you know, Uber Eats and DoorDash and companies like that get away. I mean, you look at the the price you're paying for delivery, but whenever you compare the actual price of the food items, it's it's so much more now. Like I'm Oh, that they've just changed the prices of the items themselves. Oh yeah. Like you yeah. do pick no, up. There's no it's delivery like, fee. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, or it's only three dollars, you know. Oh yeah. And you're like, oh, okay. Oh, cool. I can afford that. But you're like, wait a sec. I I go to this store. I know it's not eighteen dollars for this fucking bowl, you know? Right. So. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Shit like that. Well, hey, capitalists are gonna do capitalist things. And these schools are absolutely in the business of making money. You know, they might be nominally nonprofits, but I guarantee that she has a certain amount of revenue that she has to bring into her school every year. Mm -hmm. And she can talk all she wants about, you know, crafting the class, getting the perfect fit and all that, but <laughs> the perfect fit on the cash the balance statement sheet is, yeah, <laughs> that's what's really going to matter. Yeah. Okay. Next one is from Katie. Why don't you go ahead and read it? Okay. The subject is I got 12 points lower. On the real exam, then my last practice test, what now? Question mark. Take it again. Take it again? Yeah. I mean, that happens all the time. It's not unusual. So I thought our, you were talking to me. <laughs> no, no. No, I wasn't asking you to take it again. You did great on the read. Thanks, I was just man. giving Katie advice after her subject yeah, of her email. Take it again. A hundred percent. Yeah. All right. But let's see the specifics. Hi, I'm a great student, but a bad test taker. I have a 4.0 GPA and just graduated in the top of my class at Cambridge, but I always struggle with tests. I studied for the LSAT full time for four months. And in the last six weeks before my exam, I was consistently scoring between 168 and 175 under accommodated timed conditions on three real practice tests. And in that range during about 50 minute time section. Okay. Cambridge. She doesn't mean Cambridge in England. She means Cambridge, Massachusetts. I think she means Harvard. Okay. This is a, she could mean MIT. A she could mean <laughs> other schools in Cambridge, but I don't, I don't think she means because Cambridge in England does not give grades on a four, four on a scale like scale. that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Yep. Okay. So between 168 and 175 under accommodated time conditions on three real practice tests and in that range during about 50 time sections. Wow. Okay. I got really anxious before my exam and I ended up scoring a 163. My diagnostic was a 149, so I'm happy to see improvement, but I'm crushed at the dip. I took a month off, got some better anxiety management tools, and I'm starting to study again, but I can't do it full time now. And I'm not sure how to trust myself and my practice test scores after this. I was using LSAT Demon Basic, but I've upgraded to premium. What tips do you have for not repeating my mistakes on a retake? During practices, I get minus two on reading comp, minus three to minus five on logical reasoning and minus zero on easy logic games, but minus three on deviant games. Hmm. How do you over, how do you avoid overthinking? Well, I mean, first, producer Eric looked up for us LSAT Demon Daily episode 690. Don't let test anxiety become an excuse. You can find that on YouTube or whatever podcast app. Um, we'll link to it in the show notes if you're on thinkinglsat.com. There's, there's, a, there's a bit here to unpack. We've talked about it a lot in the past that, you know, we think that if you score dramatically outside your range on the day of the test, which is almost exclusively lower. Does anybody ever score dramatically above their range on the day of the official test? Depends on what you mean by dramatically, but we've definitely seen people score above. Yeah, but like this, 12 points. Yeah, no, it doesn't happen. Probably not, right? 
But but we do see people pretty frequently fuck up the official test. Katie blames anxiety. A lot of people blame anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it probably has something to do with doing something different on the actual day. Yeah. Yep. Like They're what? Calm. <laughs> going too fast or going too slow. Trying to get perfect, right? Trying to shoot for your best practice test score, which would be a 175 or even higher than that. Like today's the day. Today I'm really going to do it. And the problem with that, of yep. course, is then you just, you don't do it how you normally do it and you don't score yep. in your range. You didn't treat it like a practice test for whatever reason. There's a lot of ways that people get way overly stuffy about the official test. And, you know, it's like they over prepare. They perfectly arrange their day before the test. They they give the test, the official test, all of this respect that they really shouldn't be. They should be treating it like it's just another practice test. It's very likely that Katie went in there knowing that she's scoring 168 to 175 consistently but then really tried for that 175 on the day. <laughs> just a little too fast or the opposite, just a little too careful. You're doing something different. You can feel that you're doing something different. You start to get rattled. Next thing you know, you score way below your range. No big deal, right? That's why we take the LSAT multiple times. You should get right back on the horse. You should continue to study. You should do some soul searching about, I mean, I'm glad you're doing some anxiety management stuff. That's great. Little meditation, whatever it is for you. Um, but more than that, I think you need to take it to heart that we want you to treat these official tests like it's just another practice test. And we want you to go in there happily scoring something in your range, not really shooting for the top of your range. I think that that's what people do all the time. You get so committed to that idea. Today's going to be the day I'm going to score 175. And then you get one of these deviant games and you realize, oh shit, I fucked up. I didn't finish the last game or whatever. Well, now it's impossible for me to score a 175. Now I really got to make it up on the logical reasoning and the reading comprehension. Now I score a 162 because or 163 because I I'm just out of my I'm not playing my game. Yeah. Next one's from anonymous K through JD last year grades. I'm applying next fall and I currently have a 4.0 GPA and a 170 LSAT. Since I'm applying as a K through JD in September, would getting lower grades during my senior year matter? <laughs> I've been pushing off the hardest classes I have left for this reason. Is this correct? Not tremendously lower, but maybe getting a few B's since I'll be trying to work and save up money my last year of college. You're going to make a lot more money by going to a school for free or getting even a stipend. I would keep those grades up. I would also consider retaking the LSAT. It looks like you have the opportunity to do better. That's where you can make some real money. Yeah, I, I agree with those points. Absolutely. Um, if you can do better than a 170, do better than a 170 because that's the wrecking ball. I mean, that's the way to just make nothing matter. Um, your grades are already so great, right? You're above the 50th at every school, maybe not Yale, and you're above the 75th percentile at the vast majority of schools with a 4.0. And if you're going to be in the 170s with your LSAT, then you're an excellent application. But your grades during your senior year do absolutely matter. And don't think that you can get admitted based on your freshman, sophomore, junior grades, then just totally slack off in your senior year or in your second semester of your senior year, because they are going to review your final transcripts. It's your final GPA that's going to go on the ABA 509 report. And yep. it's your final GPA that's going to be used for law school rankings. I mean, so, this person's not planning to totally slack off, but w what we're saying here, right, is that even a few Bs is going to make a difference, especially for someone who's applying to the top schools. And especially for somebody who has a 4.0. Yeah. I mean, getting an entire semester of Bs, yeah, so let's say it's seven-eighths of a 4.0 and then one-eighth of a 3.0. So that's going to move you down one-eighth of a point you're going to end up with a 3.825 GPA. No, 3.875 GPA. 
That's a big decline. Yeah. Really? I mean, if you get all Bs, you're well, going to go from a 4.0 to a 3.875, I think. I mean, doing the math. so this person's not planning to get all Bs. They say a few Bs, but still, even if you go from a 4.0 to a 3.95, well, in some cases, now you've dropped below the median for these top schools. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Harvard, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, <clears throat> yeah. I think it's short sighted here to be, I, I like it that you're trying to save up money. Yeah, I think you got to play the the bigger picture game here. We just talked about law school debt at the top of the show. Yeah. Save and that. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're looking at six figures of law school debt. <clears throat> and if a few B's, you know, knocks down your scholarship offers by ten thousand dollars, it's you know, could easily add up to. 35, 40 grand by the time interest is taken into account and yeah, or more. So I, I wouldn't fuck around with it. Yep. Last one is from Pat. Okay. Subject is a uh, letter of recommendation time frame. Hi team. I just graduated from John Hopkins with my MA and I'm working on gathering my application material for law school. I let my initiative get the best of me and I reached out and have already received letters of recommendation from two of my former professors. However, I'm planning on applying for law school in 2025 to begin in 2026. What are your thoughts on having letters of recommendation that are around two years old? Will this be seen as a negative in a negative light in any sense? Should I have waited to ask for letters? Uh, I actually don't think it matters for former professors because their familiarity with you isn't going to change. Right. It would matter for like employment recommendations because it's like, hey, why couldn't you get someone who just reviewed your work last year or last summer? But yeah, I think that's I think that's right. Um, the other thing that people don't realize is that you can get all these letters on file <clears throat> and then you can decide later whether you which letters you want to send to which schools. So, you know, two years from now when you're actually applying, um, or I guess it's less than two years now, you'd be applying at the, in, you know, September of 2025, you will have work experience by then, presumably. Mm -hmm. And you might have letters that you think are better, more reflective of where you're at now. And you might decide to submit just one of those letters from a former professor and a letter from your current boss. Or, if a school happens to accept three letters of recommendation, then you've got the two former professors plus your current boss. It's not like I think people because I this is certainly what I thought. It was like, oh, two letters of you require two letters of recommendation. I'm going to go get two letters of recommendation. Yeah. But yeah. Pat, your initiative is not getting the best of you here. Your initiative is getting the best of this game. I mean, you're getting the best of the field here by getting these letters in your LSAC account you can decide whether you want to use them at any point in your future uh, law school application. And in worst case scenario, just ask for them to send you the letter again with a new date. Submit it. They'd have to submit it again through LSAC. Yeah, but it's, it's the, it's the easier part of the whole process, right? Totally. Would you mind changing the date on this? Yeah. Yeah. And just sign Although another one. I mean, I, I don't know, think you need to know. do that. I'm just saying if anyone is in this situation, it's like, hey, who cares? That's uh, the hard part is writing it. I I think contemporaneous records are more compelling. You know, like it, if mm. I know that you graduated in 2023. Yeah. Then I would love to see a letter dated 2023. Why am I looking at a letter dated 2025 if you graduated in 2023? Yeah. How well does the professor actually know you two years later? I don't know. It seems like I could make the case that I would prefer to have an older letter. The professor's thoughts at the time that the professor actually knew you. Yeah. But work harder, everyone. Work more. <clears throat> get get yes, go get these letters, get them in your LSAC account. You can decide later whether you want to use them or not. You know, and and asking multiple people lets you see who is responding really enthusiastically. Yeah. Right. If someone responds with, oh, I think you would make I think you're a perfect fit for law school. I'm so happy to write this letter for you. And then they promptly do it. Well, that's probably a good letter. 
if someone doesn't respond, they drag their feet, they say something like, really law school for you? I thought that you were going to do something else. You know, uh, I don't know. Or it just takes them forever to do it. Then that's maybe not such a good lead. I'm glad you asked them, but ask other people. Yeah. Cool. You can be LSAT famous. Please ask us questions or share news with us at Thinking LSAT. Questions about the LSAT demon, please email help at LSATdemon.com. Check out our other podcast, LSAT Demon Daily. That was episode 433 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school. 